the highest God in the hierarchy of God, so sort of like the highest value, or the thing that should be imitated most carefully, was a God that, whose, uh, whose head had eyes all the way around it, and who spoke magic words. And so the words he spoke could make the sun rise and make the sun set. Very, very powerful speaker. And the reason the Mesopotamians had figured this out to, to the degree they had was because they realized that the capacity to pay attention which is the eyes, of course, because we really pay attention with our eyes and then the capacity to speak properly is in fact the highest virtue and so then you can check yourself, you can see, all you have to do is listen like you would listen to someone else and you have to feel, you think, do I actually believe that? is that actually my thought? and really, I'll tell you, what you'll find is 95% of what you say has nothing to do with you so it's quite shocking to do this because you'll start to say something and you'll think Oh, that doesn't feel quite right, like it doesn't make me feel solid when I say it There's something about that that I'm subordinating myself to something or hiding in some way It's very difficult to figure out exactly what you're doing But you'll find out that almost everything that's abstractly represented It has to be that way because you guys are all so young So in some sense you know way more than you can actually know, right? You've been taught all these things but you don't know them, they're just in your head in fact they have you rather than the other way around it's like Carl Jung said, people don't have ideas ideas have people and that's something to really think about because then you want to watch and see what ideas there are floating around in your head and start to figure out where they came from because it's highly probable that they're controlling you just like a marionette is controlled by the puppeteer it's very very similar and there's an inauthenticity about that, and so that brings us into existentialism so now I want to talk to you a little bit about existentialists because existentialists are very concerned with authenticity and so you could say that above all else, existentialists are concerned with truth now of course we know that it's not very easy to define exactly what constitutes truth and, and I would also say there are various definitions of truth that can be used for different purposes you know, because your definitions of truth can also have a tool-like function and, and, and finally, that we can't come up with an ultimate definition of truth because we're not infinitely informed, right? so ignorance is going to underlie our claims all the time but that doesn't eradicate the validity of the concept of truth and I think one of the ways you can deal with that existentially is that you may not be able to determine what's true at any given moment but it's quite a different matter to determine what's false that's a lot easier so one of the things I often tell my clients, for example, is uh, here, here's a way to clean up your life stop doing the things that you know are wrong that you could stop doing right, so it's, it's, a, fairly, it's a fairly limited attempt first of all, we're not going to say that you know what the good is or what the truth is in any ultimate sense but we will presume that there are things that you're doing that for one reason or another you know are not in your best interests there's something about them that you just know you should stop they're kind of self-evident to you other things you're going to be doubtful about, you're not going to know which way is up and which way is down but there are things that you're doing that you know you shouldn't do now some of those you won't stop doing for whatever reason, you don't have the discipline, or maybe there's a secondary payoff, or you don't believe it's necessary, or it's too much of a sacrifice, or you're angry, or resentful, or, or afraid, who knows so forget about those for now but there's another subset that you could stop doing, it might be a little thing well, that's fine, stop doing it, and see what happens and what will happen is, your vision will clear a little bit and then something else will pop up, in your field of apprehension that you will also know you should stop doing and that you could stop doing because you strengthened yourself a bit by stopping doing the particular stupid thing that you were doing before that just puts you together a little bit more and you could do that repeatedly for, for an indefinite period of time and, and you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to ever be able to formulate a clear and final picture of what constitutes the truth and the good but it does mean that you'll be able to continually move away from what's untruth and what's bad and, you know, that's not a bad start now, Solzhenitsyn, who we'll talk a lot about in the next lecture Solzhenitsyn was a great Russian writer 
He wrote a book called The Gulag Archipelago, which was instrmental in bringing down the Soviet Union And Solzhenitsyn, like Viktor Frankl, who you'll also read, was very much convinced that the reason the horrors of the Soviet Union and of, the, of Nazi Germany and, and of Mao's China and various other places around the world, he was very convinced that the reason those horrors took place, the death and torture of hundreds of millions of people, was because the individuals that made up that, those societies were inauthentic in their own use of, of thought and speech. And so, the, it isn't a following orders theory, it's, it's not that at all, it's a bottom-up pathology theory It's the reason the whole state is pathological, is because the individuals that compose it are pathological Not because they're good in following orders So, I, 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 believe, that, I believe that to be the case, I do believe that the catastrophes of the state are a consequence of the amalgamated Pathologies of the individuals, especially their willful blindness And so, another thing that you might think about Because most young people do think about this Is, what is it that you can do in order to Aid the world, let's say, like you might if you were thinking about being an environmentalist Well, as far as I can tell The one sure route to aiding the world is to clean up your existential space First of all, you're not telling anyone else what to do, that's a big plus And second, well, the more you do that, the more you're going to be able to do things You know, and so you might think, well, if you're going to clean up the world You might start by cleaning up your phenomenological space And see how far you get with that It's a very difficult thing to do, but if you do it, the, be the better you get at it the more capable you are of, of handling larger and larger problems and, and that's how you should start, you should start with what's right in your grasp And with what you can control And, and that, that enables you to practice 